Hi, I'm Pastor Rick Taylor of Mishawaka First United Methodist Church, and I'm pleased you're joining with me and our people to be engaged by God's Word, God's presence, and our people. Our vision is to connect people to people and people to Jesus so that daily what is real in heaven becomes real here on earth. Take a moment to invite your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, and family to participate today in the Woodshop Word. Watch your e-news for an announcement coming up about our Lenten pull-up and pick-up. We will have our 40-day Lenten devotionals, ashes for you to self-apply during our virtual Ash Wednesday service, along with some other items for Lent. Today is a communion Sunday for us, and I invite you to join our communion portion in the closing of today's service. All you need to participate is grape juice or a substitute for that, and some type of bread or cracker. Today, we're looking at winning and losing. It's on the minds of many people, and especially on a day that's become kind of a, a unofficial holiday, Super Bowl Sunday. And I thought hearing about what the Bible says about winning would be timely, and also in our time of polarization around the world would be appropriate as well. Our scripture today comes from the New Testament, from the book known as the first letter to the Corinthians. And I'll be reading from the Message Bible in the ninth chapter, verses 24 through 27. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No lazy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out myself. Our music piece today says that when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. And then in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of faults and failures, when people misunderstood, when I'm growing old and feeble, when my life becomes a burden, stand by me.
I so appreciate our music team as they provide spiritual nurture during the pandemic, adjusting and pivoting quickly so that we can be a part of nurturing in the tones of music and the lyrics. Thank you, people, for what you've shared with us today. If you are watching this earlier on Super Bowl Sunday, later today is what I think of as an unofficial holiday, and it's upon us. It's the culmination of the NFL football season. Usually that season begins for the teams, in some ways, in earnest, in the late summer. 32 teams aiming for this date to play tonight. Of the 32 teams, 14 of those teams made the playoffs this year. By 10 p.m. tonight, 31 of those teams of the whole NFL will be losers. And one will be a winner. Kansas City. Did I say that? So I ask you, since win and lose is the name of this game, maybe we should think about getting for the 31 teams some t-shirts. You know how it is with the winners. They have t-shirts, they hats, they, they have them all prepared even before the game's over. We would do this, we would do t-shirts and hats, and it would say 2021 Super Bowl loser. And then maybe we could go a little bit further in the marketing, be more specific, and based on the record of each team, let's say for the team that came in 31st in the league, they would say 31st loser 2021 season, or 10th loser, and et cetera, et cetera. Now you're going to say to me, Rick, why is that so necessary? Why? Well, here's why. In win-lose environment, it's what they earned, right? I mean, the winners earn the win, so they get the t-shirts, they get that, they get the bling. So what about the losers? You know, a lot of people put a great deal of effort in losing. And in fact, today's losing team players are going to be paid $65,000 for their efforts. But now I want you to stop and think about this. Really, is every player, coach, front office executive, administrative person, custodial person, stadium worker, are they all losers? Think about this. The most valuable player of the game, the MVP, always comes from the winning team, right? Well, that'd be so, except 50 years ago, Chuck Howley of the Dallas Cowboys was the most valuable player in the Super Bowl in a loss to the Baltimore Colts. It was Super Bowl V, played in 1971. There were 11 turnovers in that game. Howley, as a linebacker for the Cowboys, was responsible for three of those. You know, hey, maybe we've learned our lesson about winners and losers, right? But what happens if we were to transform our world in the meaning of winner and loser? into the spiritual and faith realm. Well, I guess maybe if we took it on just the surface level, we'd say, well, we're all toast because Jesus was the only winner, right? And there could only be one real winner because everybody else is a loser. To quote a phrase that's often used in teams, second place is the first loser. Well, lest you think I'm against competitive activities at this point, I'm not. I'm a really highly competitive person. All you have to do is ask Ray and look at her thumb in the picture today because she's telling you I'm a competitive person. And yet one of the images I enjoyed a couple weeks ago was an image on the football field at the New Orleans Saints when Drew Brees and Tom Brady were talking together after the game. Somebody with a camera caught Tom Brady throwing a pass into the end zone actually to one of Drew Brees' sons. They were just chatting away, people who've been friends over a number of years, at a particular level, even though they'd been competing on the field just minutes before. Winning means being at the, at the top, right? But for how long? I've always enjoyed Sparky Anderson's comment that every 24 hours, the world turns over on someone who was sitting on top of it. And he ought to know. He was on top of it in the baseball world a couple different times. 
And actually, he managed the Cincinnati Reds and Detroit Tigers over 26 years. And during that time period, he won three World Series, two with Cincinnati and one with Detroit. Now, if you want to think about winning being on top, if you do the math on that, that means Sparky Anderson won 12% of the time, which means roughly the other 88%, he was a loser. Well, does losing become a definition of who we are? I suppose if you want to say that for Sparky Anderson, you'd say percentage-wise he was far more a loser than he was a winner, but we remember him as one of the greatest managers. No, I don't think that's what winning and losing is about, and particularly when we transform it into the arena of the spiritual and faith world. And I really don't believe that's what Paul wants us to draw from today's scripture, where he uses running, think cross-country, as an example. And first, Paul draws our attention to the training that's necessary to run well in competition. Now, I just have to tell you that running and cross-country in my book seems a lot more like punishment than it does enjoyment and sport. But there are those who love it, and Gus, thinking of you today, running those marathons. But it points out, Paul points out, that this effort for something tangible, and Paul identifies, you know, that gold medal, in, in the physical world is something that fades, and it, it not only fades in terms of how it looks, but it fades from our memory, too. So who remembers who won Super Bowl 50? Anybody? I'm not hearing much. Ray's not telling me. Well, it was Denver who won Super Bowl 50. And those of you who are Indiana Colts fans uh, might, uh, might remember that that was good old Peyton Manning's last Super Bowl win. Well, who did they play? You know what? I got to confess to you. I had to look both of those up because I couldn't remember. Carolina Panthers lost that game. For Paul, this whole thing about win-lose and using the athletic arena as an example is about the effort and the focus it takes and the training of our spiritual disciplines, heart, mind, soul, and body, to be focused upon maturing in Jesus Christ and serving as Jesus Christ. Even more, Paul uh, exhorts us and, and coaches us not to back off, not to coast, or not just simply to, to stand and talk about what happened in the past, about what we did, the training we did, or the wins we had, or all of those kinds of things. But Paul says we need to be a part of doing it now, to be a part of what God is doing now. We keep our focus on that goal of going through the finish line, winning in faith my friends, is to live daily to please God, to be the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, patience, self-control, to be a part of what Matthew says in his gospel about ask, ask, seek, and knock, to love your neighbor as yourself. My friends, those are all things that are that finish line that we keep running through day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour, week by week, year by year, until we reach the line where we step into the face-to-face -face presence of Jesus Christ in God's kingdom. And the reality is that as we run that race up and down over hills, Sometimes we find that we have to detour, we have to adjust, we have to adapt. And sometimes that adaptation is the straightest path to a greater relationship with others for Jesus Christ. I think about some of the runners you see in cross country who stop to help a competitor who's staggered, who's fell, or, or someone who's collided. They, they sacrifice the win at that physical finish line for the win in the relationship and kingdom world. That there are things more important, there are realities more important than physically winning in this world. And that when we begin to reshape what winning means, it's not just simply the individual win, but rather it's the win that happens with us in the community, in the community of faith. 
There's a short book that I've read. It's called Stay on Stranger by William S. Dutton. Written so contemporary, 1954, actually before I was born. And this book talks about a woman who in 1916 moved from Boston where she was raised as a part of what I would call American arist aristocracy to the Appalachian Mountains. She was educated in some of the finest schools at the time, Chauncey Hall, a preparatory school, Radcliffe College. But in the midst of her early years, she suffered from spinal meningitis, which partially paralyzed her right side. Some of that challenge became so great that she left school and began to work for a Boston newspaper, as the book puts it, on the other side of the tracks. She began to experience life in different ways. And eventually one of her doctors suggested that she find a better climate. And so she chose a place in Appalachia. Interesting enough, a Presbyterian church in Boston had had a mission cabin, a, a presence in the Appalachians. And it had been abandoned, and so she and her mom set off on horse and buggy to go there in part to help her health. When she arrived in the mountains, one of the individuals she met was a 40-year-old woman. Her children looked sickly. None of them knew how to read. She looked beaten down by life. And in some ways, she felt a bit like she herself did. When asked why she came from Boston, she replied that she thought that maybe misery loved company. And the, the woman said, stay on, stranger, the book's title. And then in her, her dialect, Ewans won't get lonely here. One of her early encounters was with a family and a little girl in homemade clothes who looked at at this woman and her mom, at the well-groomed horse, the brass ornaments on the harness, the varnish buggy, all things that weren't seen in Appalachia. Those things were all worn by New England standards. The little girl reached up and touched a, a threadbare part of her sleeve on her coat. And then she responded to the woman and her mom, Be you and princesses? She said what? seemed to me to be natural and, and actually not so high on the list troubled her and she became ashamed. She said to the people that she was now joining, her least was much. And she said she was humble, truly humble, for the first time in recognizing what it meant to be human and what it meant to have and have not. Well, this woman who had been working for a newspaper and carried her manual typewriter, an Oliver number nine, sat about living with and among her new neighbors. She didn't so much set out to change them in a place called Caney Creek, but she recognized the opportunity to contribute to life, to run the race, if you will, to raise up teachers, leaders, doctors, lawyers, not by so much bringing somebody in but by raising up people to serve there. There were barely any elementary level schools. There were no junior highs, there were no high schools, and certainly no colleges or universities in that part of Appalachia. So with her Oliver manual, number nine typewriter, typing with her left hand, because her right hand was partially paralyzed from her illness, the spinal meningitis. Over a period of years, she raised $2 million. She sent 200 young men and women to university, expenses paid. And her work was a stimulus for 15 high schools across a broad area of the Appalachian Mountains. 
She founded a junior college in that area in 1923. It became a full college. And that town is called Pippa Pass. You can look it up on your map. You can Google it. You'll find it. It's a little bit, it's mostly east, a little bit south of London, Kentucky. Those of you who drive north and south on the interstate uh, heading to the warmer climes will go past London. You'd only have to make a turn to the east and the south and go and find Pippa Pass. That town was named for a poem that Robert Browning wrote called Pippa Passes. Today, 98 years later, there are youth from 108 counties in three state area of Appalachia who have free tuition at that college she established. The requirement, one of the requirements that you have when you're there is to serve the college and serve the community, not only during your education, but after your schooling as well. Who was this woman? Her name is Alice Lloyd. You may never have heard of her. The college in Pippa Pass bears her name. What does it mean to win? It means a total investment of ourselves in Christ to run through the finish line. For you see, for Alice Lloyd, underneath the surface of all of those actions was a running of her race for the kingdom of God, focused on the purpose of life, of raising people up. In fact, the main street in Pippa Pass is named Purpose, and the side streets in that very small community are named for pieces of virtue and principles for living the race that Paul talks about. Every day in your work, your recreation, your leisure, your hobby, what will it mean for you to serve Christ today, to run the race today? Our ministry of music today, as we move into communion, is a hymn titled, How Great Thou Art. I pray that you're drawn into the majesty, majesty and the, the primacy of God and Jesus Christ in this hymn. And as you hear the second verse sung, which is actually the fourth verse in that hymn, it identifies for us the finish line of our physical life's race. Each time we have sight of that resurrection power, it is a sign of our ultimate win in Jesus Christ. And the refrain says, Then sings our soul, our Savior God, to thee, how great you are.
I'm pleased to have you with us for the sacrament of, sacrament of communion. It is a means, a pathway of God's communication of love and grace and acceptance into your life and the life of anyone who receives communion. There is no doctrinal requirement for you to receive the communion elements of bread and juice. There is really a heart and soul question which you answer with Jesus. Do you desire to have a more intimate and closer walk with him, to seek forgiveness of your sins, to walk with him more fully in this race in life? You receive communion. You do not take it. Consider the fullness of grace offered to you and to every person and consider all who willingly come to Jesus' table are welcome. When you receive the bread and cup, you remember, or perhaps for the first time, you realize the gift and the extent of love given fully, invested by God through Jesus Christ. I invite you to be with me in this moment. Will you pray? Lord God, throughout the whole of human history, you have sought and continue to seek each of us. Your desire is to restore and grow the original bond and the life-giving relationship you intended for every human being. Your desire is for us to live in the midst of a peace, a rhythm of harmony that matches and aligns our thoughts and actions with you. We know we experience the peace that passes our human understanding as we train moment by moment for your life race. We admit to you that we have not always followed your coaching directions and that at times we have taken your life race to be solely ours, colliding and injuring other people and at the same time tarnishing your kingdom's name. We have played louder and stronger in demanding our own way, disrespecting your leadership of our lives. Today, forgive us, we ask. Restore us that we might run the race you have for us, to be a part of your team, to be your spiritual athletes of grace and transformation. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he lifted the bread to you, O Lord, and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And near the close of the Passover meal, Jesus took the cup of blessing. He gave thanks to you, Lord God, and he said these words that more than echo throughout eternity. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins and for the forgiveness of sins of many. Take and drink and do it in remembrance of me. Jesus, we ask now that as we receive these elements of bread and the cup, that you will accept us as a living and a holy sacrifice, transformed for your kingdom's unity, power, presence, and mission. We pray that Jesus will work in us and with us, that the work being done now becomes even more evident in our thoughts, our choices, and our actions, so that we will be the presence of grace, the foundation of your kingdom, and your will, in living human action. And now I invite you, where you are, to take your bread. The body of Christ, broken for you. Take the cup the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you. Will you pray with me? Lord, we take in a deep breath and we exhale. We've learned that as we run the race of life, that our breathing of you in and exhaling out the world is a means of cleansing us from the poisons of life, just as a runner cleanses the carbon dioxide from their lungs and their body. The life-giving oxygen flows in us and through us, just as your Son, Jesus the Christ, flows through us spiritually,
cleansing us from sin and bringing the freshness of your grace, filling up our lives, our soul, and our body space. We thank you for the depth and breadth of your love, a love which leads us to life upon life, to the finish line, into eternity. Amen. Thank you for being a part of our worship today. We so appreciate the opportunity to represent the body of Christ to you, believing as you share this service with others and take what Jesus has revealed to you today in the midst of our time together, that we are training and playing for God's kingdom in powerful ways. Seek to add spiritual athletes to Jesus' team as a disciple. And part of the reason I say that for on God's team, there is no such thing as a backup player. There is no such thing as a bench player. My friends, we are all in the game. I invite you to consider uh, giving to the ministries of Mishawaka First United Methodist Church. That can be accomplished through the online means on our website. It can be done by snail mail. The gifts that we receive go to provide ministry in and throughout the Mishawaka, Michiana community, as well as the state of Indiana and around the world. My friends, God bless and Godspeed.